you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. I guess I could add a precision on that article. If you're interested in more details, we're giving a talk on Friday in Wolfenson Hall about, about this. So yes, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you all for coming. Uh, what I would like to talk about today is a project that I've been working on for about a year uh, in collaboration. So I'll be, I'll be talking about two results today. And uh, one is in collaboration with Joe Leibowitz from Rutgers University, whereas the second uh, is in was a collaboration with Elliot Lieb from Princeton University. And uh, it will be about discussing high density phases in systems of particles. I'll give you a little de a few details on about what I mean by that in a minute. But first, let me mention that if you're interested in uh, details about these results, we have preprints uh, on the archive. This is the first result with uh, Joe Leibowitz, and this is the second result with Elliot Lieb. As usual, I indicated my, my personal website, uh, which has all sorts of, of nice resources and figures and so forth. So also, please don't hesitate to interrupt with questions if such questions should arise. I, I'm going to try to be as non-technical as I can. There are limitations to that, so please stop me if I, if I go too far. So what I want to talk about today is high density phases of matter. Why do I care about high density phases of matter? Well, they, they appear in nature in, in lots of different, different ways. And in particular, uh, something that I will be talking about a lot today are phase transitions between gases, liquids, and crystals. Now, most of you are probably aware that a certain number of, of materials occur in several different phases, like water, for example, can be a liquid, as, as it, in most of our interaction with water is with liquid water. It can also be a gas, and you are probably aware that there is at least one crystalline phase, is, at least one crystalline phase in water called ice. There actually are several of them. Uh, I won't be going into too many details. Now, the... I've, I've heard of six different ones, and I'm sure there are more. Well, there you go. There must be at least nine, I suppose. Um, now, all these different phases have very different properties. Uh, liquid ice, uh, liquid water, liquid water flows. Uh, ice does not, and there, there are all sorts of physical physical differences between these. The one that I will be focusing most that, that will focusing that I will be focusing on today is the density. The density of all th all of of all three phases is very different. Now I'm going to stop talking about ice now and, and talk about simpler models because ice has. has uh, why do I keep saying ice? Water. I'm going to stop talking about water now and talk about talk about simpler models because water is somewhat complicated. Typically, the gas phase in materials is uh, sparse. It's not dense. The density in a gas phase is very low. There are few particles that are running around. Whereas in the liquid phase, the density jumps to a higher value. And then when you crystallize, the density jumps once again to yet a higher value. For water, this is not true, as since, uh, as you may know, ice is actually less dense than liquid water. But that's, a, that's another story. Now, we would like to understand, on a from a mathematical point of view, how to, um, how to compute things for these phases, how to uh, compute properties for these, the, this material in these different phases. Now, it turns out that the low density is something that is fairly easy to understand, something that is fairly easy to treat. The reason for this is that what, uh, typically the interactions between particles in these materials are finite range or they decay, which means that if I take a particle over here and I take another particle and, throw and, and move it very far away, these two particles won't see each other. They won't interact. If the density is very low, then this means that the dynamics of my particles is essentially given by the dynamics of independent particles with some small corrections that come from the fact that there is an interaction. But, but since the intera this interaction is weak because particles at low density are typically far away, the corrections will be small. As I move to higher densities, this picture breaks down. 
at extremely high densities in crystalline ion states, particles will be interacting strongly. Every particle, the, the reason that the crystalline state exists is because the particles are interacting. The effect of the interaction becomes large, and this picture of having almost independent particles that are corrected by an interaction breaks down. So the question is, what do we do when we're looking at these high density phases? Okay. Now let me introduce um, let me introduce a little bit of notation that will be useful throughout this talk. To I'm going to be talking about several different models. In order to introduce the notation, I'll talk about one simple model uh, for which it is believed that there is a a gas phase and a crystalline phase, which is the so-called so hard sphere model. In this model, particles are spheres. And the interaction between spheres uh, is restricted to the fact that spheres are not allowed to overlap. That's the only interaction that there is. If the two spheres are non-overlapping, they essentially don't see each other. Okay? In the hard sphere model, we believe that there's a gas phase and there's a solid phase. There is no, there, at least we believe there is no liquid phase um, in the hard sphere model. And so. What, what do I mean? So from a mathematical standpoint, how do I approach this problem? Well, I have these hard spheres. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to sample the sets of sphere configurations, of acceptable sphere configurations, of configurations that don't have overlap according to some probability distribution. Okay? The probability of a configuration of spheres uh, is going to be proportional to a parameter z, which is the activity of the, it's, it's the activity of the model. It's a parameter. It's a non-negative real number that is raised to the power of the number of spheres in my configuration. Are we in a box now? Then? Yes, I'm the about to say that. The spheres, yes, let's take spheres of equal size. So the, uh, here I'm mostly introducing the formalism. It's true in so the, the no, it's to get the notation right, uh, this, uh, this formalism applies to all sorts of different interacting particle systems. So in order to make a probability distribution out of this, uh, I'm going to uh, put myself in a finite volume. The idea is that once I'm in a finite volume, I can define the probability distribution, uh, define observables, compute values of observables, and then take the limit in which the size of the box goes to infinity. Okay, So I'm going to fix myself in a box that I call lambda. So this will be the probability distribution of a configuration in a box lambda. What it will be, it will be z to the number of spheres. And then this will be multiplied by a normalization factor, which I denote by 1 over psi of lambda, psi is called the partition function of the model. Function. And is a normalization of the is a normalization of the of this probability distribution. And you can easily convince yourself that the expression of this psi can be written quite simply as uh, a sum over n, n is going to be the number of spheres that I have in my configuration. Runs from 0, let's say, to infinity, times z to the n, times now this other function, let's make it a, a curly z, uh, lambda of n, which is the number of configurations with n spheres. In this case, the hard sphere model is a continuum model, so this would actually be the measure of the configurations with n spheres. But this is, so to give you an example, if I have one sphere, the number of configurations with one sphere is going to be the volume of the box. If I have two spheres, the number of configurations will be, well, I have the volume of the box for the first sphere, and then I have the have volume of the box minus the volume of the first sphere for the second sphere, and so on. OK. Yes, uh, this, par this parameter z here, which is the activity, uh, is related to the density. Why is it related to the density? Well, the probability is proportional to z to the number of spheres. So if z is large, 
that I'm assigning a high probability to configurations that have many spheres, to dense configurations. If z is low, then I'm assigning a, high, I'm assigning a higher probability to, the, to configurations with few spheres. Right? And there's a one-to-one -one mapping between the, this activity here and the density. Low, low activity means low density. High activity means high density. So what I want to uh, discuss here today is what happens for high values of z. But before I move to high values of z, let me just try and convince you that low values of z is not really a problem. Because, so I'm, let's see, if I want to compute this quantity here, this is the partition function. It's, it's the normalization of the probability distribution. It turns out it has a number of, uh, of, uh, of, of interesting properties that are relevant to the thermodynamics of the model. So being able to compute this, this quantity is interesting. Or rather, being able to compute a quantity that is related to this, which is called the pressure of the model, which is defined as 1 over lambda times the logarithm of psi, has relevant thermodynamic uh, properties. Has relevant thermodynamic yeah, properties. That works. Now, if my density here, if my fugacity here is low, if z is small, this thing here looks like a power series in z. It's actually a polynomial in z because I have the hard sphere condition, the, the, I, have, I have the hard core condition that says that I cannot pack an infinite number of spheres in a finite volume. Inside this volume lambda, I can only put a finite number of spheres. So this here is a polynomial in z that has non-negative coefficients. The coefficient that corresponds to power 0 is z to the power 0. The number of configurations with zero spheres is by convention 1. So this is a polynomial with non-negative coefficients whose uh, zeroth order coefficient is 1. I can take its logarithm, expand its logarithm in powers of z, and I get a convergent expansion for the pressure here at small values of z. Now the question is, what do you do if z is large? Well, OK, here's something simple that I can do. If z is large, then the density is high. If the density is high, most of my space will be occupied by particles, which means that there will be a low fraction of my space which will be defects, which will be regions of space that are not occupied by particles. So I can change the picture from a particle picture to a defect picture, from a particle picture to a whole picture. Instead of looking at where the particles are, I want to know where there are no particles. And if I'm looking at a high density of particles, then my defects should be in a low density phase. right? And I know how to treat low density phases. Things are not so simple. And let me, tell, let me try and explain to you why, in this specific example of the hard spheres, why it's difficult to treat a configuration of hard spheres as a configuration of defects. Well, whereas the geometry of, of hard spheres is rather simple, they're just spheres, defects can have very strange shapes. They can have fairly arbitrarily strange shapes. And to give you an idea of, what, of how bad this can be, if I'm at very high density, I take an activity z that is very large, not infinite, but very large. This means that the density is close to the optimal density. It's close to the density of the packing that I drew here, but not quite there. Well, I could have a bad situation. You could imagine a bad situation in which uh, I have a sphere here and a sphere next to it, which instead of being in the position that it would be in this crystalline structure, is just slightly further, infinitesimally further. This changes the density by a little bit. But now the next sphere can be infinitesimally further from the second one. And the, and the fourth sphere is infinitesimally further from the third one. Thus, uh, creating this, but by taking away very few spheres, I can have very delocalized defects. Defects that can take, take up um, a very large portions of the volume by just removing one sphere, by just re it's reducing the density 
by a very small amount. This is why treating high density phase, well, this is one of the reasons why treating high density phases is non trivial. Also, that densest thing is not unique. That's correct. Uh, so there's uh, the, the question of figuring out what the densest packing for hard spheres is was a, a, an open problem for a very long time. It's the common lore says it dates back to Kepler. Who knows whether that's actually true? And there's a proof, a recent proof by or recent. There's a proof by by Hales uh, that uh, says that the that determines which which packings are the densest packings. And there are there is an infinite number of of packings which which are the densest ones. Some are periodic, others are not. Well, suppose that If you, if you kind of pack in, meaning they don't come up naturally. Then. Well, yeah, so if you, if you take a random packing, then you get a different density, yes. Which is optimal. Which is, quite yes, that's right. Uh, OK, are there any questions? So, so, uh, so the statement is, in the infinite, if z is small, in, in the infinite volume limit, that will be a nice analytic function about the origin. Yes, that's right. And that's something that is not so difficult to prove by just expanding this logarithm and seeing what terms you get, what cancellations come out. What is it you're looking for? You're looking for some space transition in variable z? That's why are you mm. interested in where it's going to pass? Uh, I am interested in phase transitions in, in terms of z. I'm also interested in just understanding the phase at high values of z. If I move z along the real axis, then, then that thing will fail to be analytic at some point. Is that correct? That is correct. Well, so, OK, if I take this expression here as a function of z, uh, it's an analytic function for small values of z in the complex plane. It's going to have a finite radius of convergence. At some point, there's going to be, an, there's going to be a singularity. Now, this singularity, and this is typically true in statistical mechanical systems, does not occur on the real positive axis. I told you that the activity is a real positive, real non-negative parameter. These singularities don't typically appear on the real positive axis. They typically appear somewhere else in the complex plane, which means that the singularity, the point at which I lose analyticity of this, of this guy. Now, loss of analyticity is, is important because by having a, a pressure here that's analytic, I can compute it as a power series. If I lose analyticity, I can no longer compute it as a power series. I lose a very valuable tool for figuring out what the value of this thing is. Now, figuring out what the value of the pressure is, is, is important because similar techniques are usually used to figure out what the probability distribution is, and I can compute a certain number of observables in this problem. So this comes back to your question of what I'm actually trying to compute. Well, in this case, I want to compute. I want to prove crystallization. I want to prove that there is a long-range structure in this probability distribution. So I'm interested in analyticity properties of this, of this well, pressure the here. The outstanding question, which is, I guess, far from what you're going to talk about, or far from what we can do these days, is to prove that that, as a function of the uh, on the wheels, has a has a singularity. Right. 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 Uh, so that so there's typically you lose analyticity because of a singularity that's non-physical. Uh, that's yeah. somewhere on the complex uh, level. The, but what, we, what is physical, what we are actually interested in, is what happens on the non-negative non real axis. But if you're interested in jump in the density, that would appear as a real singularity, right? Because the density can be computed by differentiating. That's right. So if there is a phase transition, if, there, if as is believed, there actually is a phase transition from a gas phase to a crystalline phase, then there will be a singularity on the real axis. On the positive, sorry, yes, on the positive real axis. Uh, the question is, can I prove this? And can I prove anything around this singularity? And so far, no. But we would like to. Uh, OK. You think it's impossible to make an analytic variable change to z, which brings that singularity closest to the origin, so that it, it is what determines the radius of convergence? That's not known, right? It's, no, well, of course, it's, it's... In terms it's, of a naive z, it's yes. probably 
pretty clear that the closest singularity is not in the real axis, the positive real axis. Yes. But this is not necessarily a general. Right. Well, if you, if you have a distribution of these singularities, you can always come up with a change of variables that is going to, exactly. going to rescale. Right. The, the thing is. Well, not necessarily always, but yeah. Well, if I'm giving, given the distribution, I can construct a yeah. change of variables so that is going so to make it work. The thing is, in this case, I don't even know whether there is a singularity on the real and positive axis. Of course there is. <laughs> <laughs> I know that you, th I, 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 I believe you. <laughs> if there is a phase transition on the positive real axis, then there is a singularity. One. Absolutely. But for, the, okay. for this <laughs> model in particular, so the question is, how would I compute this? What would be my change of variables that I would need to do in order to see this? And that's, that's a non-trivial question. Further questions? OK. All right. Uh, so for the hard sphere model, the transition between this gas phase and this crystalline phase, or even the understanding of the crystalline phase for the hard sphere model, is a hard problem. It's an open problem. Uh, I don't have a result for that. I'm going to instead present uh, a first result, which is about crystallization in a simpler model, and something that is even simpler than the hard sphere model. Yes. Could you compute speed numerically to see whether you can find like experimentally yeah. where the singularity is computed? If I said no, I'd get yelled at. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So it, this is an active area of research of trying to figure out algorithms to compute, to sample this probability distribution in an efficient way for large values of lambda, for large, large lambdas. So obviously, if lambda is small, I won't have any problems. The question is. If lambda is large, I'm going to have lots of variables. Can I find a way of sampling this probability distribution efficiently uh, so that I can, I can compute values of observables numerically? And this is usually done using Monte Carlo techniques and various, uh, various um, refinements of that, yes. And so for the hard sphere model, there is extensive numerics that indicates rather c clearly, I believe, that there is a phase transition from a gas phase to a solid phase, that this phase transition has a jump, it has a, a, a discontinuity in the density. Uh, so it, it seems to be true. OK. So I mentioned that one of the difficulties with understanding this phase is that the geometry of my defects can be very, uh, can be arbitrarily complicated. I can have very small defects uh, that are delocalized over very, over very large parts of my system. I'm going to ignore this problem by looking at a lattice model. Okay, I'm going to forget about this continuum model of hard spheres, which has this very this this difficulty. Uh, coming from the fact that I can move my, hearts, my spheres continuously and make very small holes in my crystalline structure that can destroy long range order by instead focusing on lattice models. Now the result that I will be presenting is a, is a criterion for uh, lattice models. So it's a, it's, a, it's a property that, so it's a criterion that if if a lattice model satisfies this criterion, then we can prove crystallization in this model. It works on lattices in two dimensions and more, 2, 3, 4, D. Uh, it doesn't work in one dimension. There uh, should presumably not be crystallization in one dimension unless you really do something strange. And just as a teaser, I put a few examples of the models that are covered by this criterion. These are models for which we can prove crystallization at high densities. OK? Those are your particles. Those, yes. So how do, how do I understand these models? I have a lattice. I have a, a grid back here. There's, most of them are on the square lattice. I, I worked hard on getting these, these three-dimensional graphs, so I, I drew everything in 2D for, the, for these. I thought I wouldn't do that much work. So I have square lattices here. Here I have a, a triangular lattice. And the way that I define my particle model is by giving a shape to each particle. These are all models of identical particles. Every particle has the same shape. And the interaction between two particles is that their shapes are not allowed to overlap. Okay? So for example, in this, in this model here, if I have a particle here, I'm not allowed to put a particle here, or else there would be overlap. 
But I am allowed to put a particle here or here or anywhere else. So this model here is equivalent to the nearest neighbor exclusion on the square lattice. I'm not allowed to have a particle that neighbors this one, but I'm allowed to have it anywhere else. This model here is the third nearest neighbor exclusion on the lattice. I exclude this vertex, I exclude this one, but I don't exclude the, I don't exclude the, sorry, I exclude this one, I exclude that one, and this one, but I don't exclude this one. I exclude the first three nearest neighbors. This model is the nearest neighbor exclusion on the triangular lattice, and then these are, these are just fun. These, for just a, uh, so I am considering here only, uh, only particles of a single species. And what I mean by species is the shape is fixed. So I cannot have coexistence of this guy with a rotated version of this guy. Not allowed to rotate. Now these guys down here, they're called polyominoes, which is one of my favorite words. These two here are tetrominoes. They have because they have four vertices. That's what the game Tetris is based on. The word Tetris comes from tetromino. But, but, uh, but uh, are hard hexagons in your, in your that, that's a fairly difficult one. Isn't it? Yeah. This one? Yeah. I got this one, yeah. So, uh, let me tell you okay. uh, just something about the hard hexagon model. This model here, yes, has the reputation of being a difficult model because it's a, this model is an integrable model. It was shown by Baxter yeah. in 82, something like that, that it's an integrable model, which means that you can compute a number of, of observables for every value of z uh, and using fairly sophisticated, te fairly sophisticated techniques. Now here, we're only looking at large values of z. You, you look at some kind of modular formula for each of these ones. Right, so there's this, 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 you know about this, this yeah. lovely paper by Joyce uh, <laughs> that uh, relates, relates the solutions of the... the, the but this is all two dimensions. This, oh, so <laughs> everything that I drew here is two dimensions. This model is in two dimensions. And everything you're going to use from now on is all two dimensions. No, so I can do... I can do this, an analog of this model any, in any dimension. Yeah, those kind of things aren't integrable. Right. And so uh, these models here, none of these models are integrable, just this one. This is the only one that's integrable. And what we're doing here, we, we don't look at the integrable structure. We forget about the integrable structure. What we do, we do expansions that work at high values of the fugacity, at high values of the activity. So the the, the very rich mathematical structure that is underlying this model um, does not induce any significant complication for our analysis. Because we're only looking, we're not finding, we're not finding solutions of the problem, we're only looking at high values of the activity. Okay? Yeah, you're not computing the partition function, you're just saying something about it. Right, well we have, so we have a, we have an expansion for the pressure. So we could argue whether that means computing or not. But it only works at high fugacities. We won't see the phase transition here. So, so what's the mathematical status of Baxter's statements about that? You, know, you, you, you might think, oh, Baxter already showed yes. certain things, and you didn't show any more than he already showed? Or do you right. For this, the, the result that I'll be presented, presenting here uh, for the, the hard hexagon on the triangular lattice, there's nothing new. You okay. take Baxter's so analysis or something. Yes. Okay. Yes. So Baxter showed there was no transition to this model? No, there is, there a, is a transition. There's, there's a crystallization. Transition. There's crystallization at high fugacities. Oh, okay. I promised a non technical talk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, so these are examples. Let me tell you uh, what, uh, what, what this criterion is. So what, uh, what conditions I require for my lattice models for there to be, um, for, there to be for, for us to be able to prove a, a crystallization transition. So we call these models non-sliding hardcore lattice particle systems. 
Right? HCLP stands for hardcore lattice, lattice particle systems. The non-sliding aspect should be clear in the next slide. There are two conditions that we require for our non-sliding hardcore lattice particle systems to be non-sliding. The first is that uh, I, I have to be able to tile my system with particles. Okay. What I mean by tile, tile the system is there must exist a particle configuration in which there is no overlap between particles that is such that every vertex is, it belongs to the shape of one of the particles. So if you look here at an example, this is the hard cross model. It's the third nearest neighbor exclusion on Z2. Um, all of these particles here, here are non-overlapping. Non, non and every vertex belongs to a single particle. That's what a tiling is. Now, I require that there is a finite number of tilings of the plane, which I denote by tau. For this model here, there are 10 tilings of the plane. Why 10? Well, there's this one here. This one is obtained by a reflection. It's different. It's a different tiling. <laughs> Oh, so look, you have this particle here, and you have to, so it's, it's the, 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 the horsey move in, in chess. I don't play much chess, that's why I call them horsies. Oh, <laughs> right. <laughs> so <laughs> you go down by one and right by two, right? Whereas up here, you go up by one and right by two. And they're a reflection, one with respect to another. And then each of these I can translate. I, so let's say I start with this particle here. I can move all of this by one, one um, by, by, a, a, in a, by a distance of one towards the left, or towards the right, or up, or down. There are five in equivalent translations for this one, five in equivalent translations for this one. The whole thing totals 10. Now, uh, I further require that these different tilings, they all be periodic. Uh, they all be related to each other by isometries. In this case, the isometries are this reflection here and the translations. Now, where does non-sliding come in? So we call them non-sliding for a reason. Let me try and Yes, so the, the definition here of tiling is the same in any dimension. Uh, it's periodic. Um, related to each other by isometries, everything works in higher dimensions. Er everything I, I, that, I, that I state here is uh, true in arbitrary dimensions. The result works in any dimension but one. One does not work. But we don't like one anyways. One is special. Non-sliding. So give you, to give you an idea of what non-sliding is, let me try and give you an idea what sliding is. I'm going to take an example. So. I showed you a, a bunch of models. There was the nearest neighbor exclusion on Z2 and the third nearest neighbor exclusion on Z2. I conveniently ignored the second nearest neighbor exclusion on Z2 because that one is a sliding model. What is the second nearest neighbor exclusion on Z2? It's a model of hard, of hard two by two squares. So they're squares that contain four lattice points, four, four vertices. And I can tile the plane with these two by two squares in this way. Those two things are enabled if they belong to some as well. Well the neighbor is one of the top two. Right, so neighbor is is um, is to be understood in terms of graph theory. So when I ha I have my underlying lattice, uh, the lattice has edges. So you can map it to a graph and neighbors are two points that are that are linked to each other by a by a neighbor. So why is this? Um, so why is this nearest neighbor exclusion? Well, uh, sorry, second nearest neighbor exclusion. If I put, how does this go? Yeah. If I put, if I decide that putting a, a square here means I put a particle here, then you can check that you exclude the neighbors and you exclude the second neighbors, but you don't exclude the third neighbors. So I can tile my plane like this. Now we're sli what sliding means is that if I take this square here and I remove it, I take it out of the configuration, 
then I can take a whole chunk from this column, an arbitrarily long sub subset of this column, and shift it up by one. That's what sliding is. I take out a particle, and I can slide things up or sideways. That's the informal definition. It has, we have a more formal definition that is given here. I'm going to try and walk you through this carefully. So what, what do we mean by non-sliding? A, a system is non-sliding if it satisfies this property here. If I take a connected particle configuration, now a connected particle configuration is a particle configuration that is such that the union of the supports of the particles forms a connected set. Like in this example down here, I have two particles. And if I look at what the supports of the particles are, it forms a connected set. Connected in the sense of graph theory again. So if I take a connected configuration x that is not the subset of a close packing, it's not the subset of a tiling, means that I cannot complete this configuration into a tiling. Now I have this configuration, and I look at a super configuration of x. I look at a configuration y that contains x. Obviously, since x is not the subset of a tiling, there is going to have to be empty space in y. What I mean by empty space is there are going to have to be vertices that are not covered by any particle. Now what we require, what the non-sliding condition tells us, is that some of this empty space will have to neighbor x, will have to be right next to the configuration x. So in this example here, my configuration x is these two particles. And you can easily convince yourself that out of these two red sites, there is no way that I can complete this configuration in such a way that both are covered by particles. One of them will necessarily be empty. Right? The same can be done for this configuration. This would be a configuration x. This red site can't be covered. Or in this configuration, out of these three sites, actually at least two cannot be covered. What does this mean? Why is this relevant? Well, it, if I have phase coexistence, let me explain what, this, what I mean by that. In this system here, my different crystalline phases are going to correspond to tilings. A tiling is a perfect crystalline phase. It's a periodic structure that, that exists on long structures. It's a perfect crystalline phase. Now, if I have two different if I have a configuration with two different tilings with an interface between the tilings, what this condition says is that along this interface, I'm going to have to have empty space along the entire interface. Why is that? Well, let me consider two particles that are on either side of the interface. Either there already is empty space and I'm happy, or they're connected. If they're connected, I know that they're not the subset of a tiling because they're on either side of the interface. Uh, and by this condition, I know that there will be empty space right near them, which means that the entire interface between these two tilings will have to, be, will have to consist of a positive fraction of empty space. Empty space is good or bad, depending on your point of view. Uh, empty space is improbable. I'm interested in high density phases. I'm interested, on in, I'm interested in large values of z, which means that I'm interested in lots of particles. If I have empty space, I reduce the number of particles. And I reduce the probability of my, of my configuration. So by requiring this condition, what we are saying is that if there is uh, a violation of the crystalline structure, if there are several different crystalline structures that are coexisting, then all along the interface I have empty space, which means that the probability of these configurations that have coexistence is going to be small, and the size of, this, of, this, of how small it is is going, to, so it's, it's going to get smaller and smaller as the size of the boundary increases. In other words, there's going to be a surface tension around these phases that makes, uh, that makes these, these coexistence configurations unlikely. OK, so let me now present the, the result. 
in order to present the result in a mathematically sound way, let me introduce the observables that I will be looking at. So I'm going to be, uh, this here is the probability distribution that's up here. No, I do not. Uh, that's a good question. That's actually a good question. Yes, yes, presumably there are. Yes. So, one of the reasons that. So, right. Do you? So, if you want to have a finite number, you're going to have to quotient out um, uh, some sort of some transformations. For instance, uh, you can easily prove that. So, this model is non-sliding. You can easily prove that any lattice refinement of the model is non-sliding. But that's a trivial, trivial transformation. One of the reasons why. Would the generic lattice animal be non-sliding? The the yeah the so <laughs> the the main restriction to talking about gen, uh, gen genericity genericity one of those words uh, for uh, these models is that part of the condition is unnatural so the non-sliding part which is the important part is the second one seems to be the so or the idea behind the non-sliding part is the physical thing <laughs> the fact that I have tilings doesn't seem to be uh, relevant. It's it's just so that it's it's a it's a technical part of the, of the of the construction that I am very convinced is not needed. So this is why I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't really look into classifying what these what these models are because there still is some non physical non physical hypothesis here. The, the fact that they need to tile this, the, the space is n really not necessary. Now, once you get rid of this condition and you manage to formulate the non-sliding condition for, uh, for systems in which you can have empty space, which will occur, for instance, if you're looking at um, hard disks on Z2 that are sufficiently large, uh, then the classification problem becomes a very interesting one. Uh, it, it becomes, uh, yeah. So you want to you want to isolate this sort of this sort of model from the others, uh, which means that you want to you want to figure out properties about close packings of uh, so uh, for instance classifying all the nearest ne you're right you're right you're right <laughs> this is just interesting sorry uh, okay this here is a, a formal way of writing this probability distribution. Uh, it's written for the observables. So A is going to be an observable. And I defined an average of this observable. Let me just go through what we have here. This sum here is the sum over configurations. A configuration I represent as a subset of my finite box. This is the, the observable evaluated at the configuration. I have my fugacity, my, sorry, my activity. I, those two words are they're the same, so they mean the same thing, so I sometimes confuse them. The activity to the power x, that's the number of particles that I have in my configuration. Here I have the hardcore condition. This is a pair interaction, goes over every pair of particles. Phi of xx prime is equal to 0 if the particles overlap. It's equal to 1 if they don't. Then I have this little index nu. Nu is a tiling. I have a finite number of tilings, and I index them. I have the first, the second, the third, etc. What I want to compute here is the following, uh, the following. I want to answer the following question. If I set boundary conditions on my box so as to favor one tiling over the others, what happens to the inside of my box? Now, there's a, uh, a notion in which uh, this uh, question should be related to what happens on the inside of my box, whatever the boundary conditions are. I won't really go into the details of that. Uh, there aren't, we don't have any proofs about that anyways. So we're looking at 
a, an ensemble, so a, a probability distribution in which we fixed boundary conditions in such a way that we favor one of the tilings over the others. Nu is the index of this boundary, con of this, this tiling. B nu of x is the boundary condition. The boundary condition will essentially say that I have particles outside my box that are all belong to this tiling nu, and the particles inside cannot overlap the particles outside. That's essentially what it is. And uh, OK, so this is, and then I have 1 over xi, which is the, the normalization, is the partition function. And then I take a limit, a thermodynamic limit, where the box lambda goes to lambda infinity as the full lattice. There's a, you can't take this limit in ridiculous ways. There are conditions on how you, you must take this limit. I won't really go into the details. And then we're interested here in the properties of the pressure. Oh, well, so sorry. We're interested in properties of this and of the pressure. So what is the result? The result, informally speaking, is that we have crystallization. How do I say this? Well, uh, let's first look at, I don't know why I wrote this second. This should be first. Let's just first look at this guy here. This says that there is crystallization. What is this? This is the average of an observable which I denote by 1x. This is equal to 1 if there is a particle at x, and 0 if there isn't. A there is a particle at x means that, uh, so you remember I, I parametrize my particle configurations as subsets of lambda that tell you where I put my particle. So this means that um, formally, if I look here at the, the hard cross, I take one of the vertices that's covered by the hard cross and call it the center. And having a particle at x means that the center is at x. It doesn't just mean that it's covered by a particle. So I look here at the probability. Uh, so this is the observable. There is a, a particle at x. So this here is the probability that x is covered. That, sorry, is the probability that there is a particle centered at x. Now this probability depends on where x is. If x is a part of the tiling, meaning that if I had this tiling nu that I put outside my boundary, and I cover the entire space with particles in this tiling, uh, this condition here says that there would be a particle in this tiling at x. If x is such a, such a position, then the probability of finding a particle there is 1 plus a correction, big O of y. y here is 1 over z. <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 way ahead of you. So z is the, fuge is the activity. We're looking at high values of the activity. Um, so 1 over z is small, and I call y 1 over z. So I have probability 1 plus a correction that decays like 1 over z. If I'm looking elsewhere, then the probability of finding a, finding a particle is small. This is crystallization. This is long range order. Why is this long range? Well, you remember I took this limit in which the size of the box goes to infinity, which means that the, my boundary is now infinitely far from x. And even though it's infinitely far, it's still telling x. It, it's, it's still, still uh, influencing the particle configuration around x. Now, how do we approach this? We do something that, in, in a way, is similar to the low activity expansion here. What we do is we expand in y. We expand in 1 over z. We take this observable here and expand it in y and compute the dominating part. The, the non-trivial part of the proof is to prove that this expansion actually works, that, that these error terms are controlled. Yes. Uh, if y is 0, then I, I have to be in a close packing configuration. My tilings are the close packing configurations because there's nothing denser than a tiling. And so this would just be 1, and this would just be 0. So what I prove is that this observable here, which is the joint probability of having a particle at x1 through xn, for this case, it's enough to just look at one of them, is an analytic function of 1 over z. Which, proves, which means that I can expand in y and I can bound these error terms. 
Now I do the same thing for the pressure. I guess I'll skip that. Uh, OK, I have some, some history here, which I'll go over somewhat quickly. So this, I rewrote the high fugacity expansion here for the pressure. So we do the same thing for this p. We expand it in 1 over z. There's a prefactor here that is, there's a, a first term here that is explicit. There's a cancellation. So this thing here, uh, if this were analytic, then it would be an estimate for the number of configurations. But this is not analytic, at least not uniformly, as lambda goes to infinity. This, in fact, is exponentially large in the size of the, of the thing. What is analytic is the pressure in which there's a logarithm. And this logarithm introduces cancellations. If there were no cancellations, you would not have an analytic. So we have this expansion in powers of y, which is 1 over z. Uh, this expansion, to our knowledge, was first introduced by Gaunt and Fisher in 1965 for the hard diamond model. That's the first model I told you about, where they, they looked at this expansion up to, up to order 9. This was later um, studied for, for hard hexagons. It's a part of this long and rich paper by Joyce. Um, the hard cross model, the third nearest neighbor exclusion, was, uh, was treated for uh, up to powers 6 by Eisenberg and Baram. But now what I'd like to finish with is what happens for sliding models. So this is all true when I don't have sliding. When I don't have sliding, I have an expansion in 1 over z which means that I can treat the high density phase if I don't have sliding. Now, if I do have sliding, it's fairly easy to see that the, this expansion in 1 over z is not only going to be divergent, it's going to be ill-defined in the limit in which the, the box goes to infinity. This is essentially because the, if I can slide things up like this, I can have correlations between defects that occur at arbitrarily high, at arbitrarily long distances. So this expansion in 1 over z will not be well defined if I can slide. So what happens? What, what can we do? Are we stuck? Well, so I'm going, now going to talk about another result. Uh, I'll go quickly over these. I like these figures, so I wanted to show them. Uh, about um, a special case of a sliding model for which one can still expand not in 1 over z, but in other variables. So even though you don't have analyticity in 1 over z, you can have analyticity in other variables, other variables that are small at high fugacity. Um, and I'll be presenting, presenting a, a result in which we did this. Uh, this is about liquid crystal. I guess I can go, go slightly fast on this. I presented this at the, the postdoc talks earlier and also last Wednesday. So that should cover most of most of the audience. Um, liquid crystals are special phases uh, that occur in systems of elongated molecules, so molecules that are, are long, thin, straight, that exhibit order in the orientation of the molecules. So in this case, all, all of them are aligned. In this case, there's a, more, more, there's a weirder order. It's, it's organized in planes. And in each plane, the molecules are aligned. And from one plane to the other, the molecules are, are rotating. This is called a chiral pneumatic phase. Now, there's or order in the orientation, but there's disorder in the position. Those, the locations of the centers of these are disordered. And in this case, within the plane, they're disordered. These two phases, they, they underline the, the, the physics of, of LCD screens that most of us are probably, have probably experienced in our lives. The model is a dimer model. It's again a two-dimensional model on Z2, in which my, my molecules are these little sticks here. They occupy an edge and the two end vertices. This is a sliding model. Why? Well, uh, if I take here, let's take a column here. I remove, I remove one of these molecules. I can shift the column up. That's a sliding model. Very easy to check 
that the pressure for this model is not analytic in 1 over z. Now, in addition to the hardcore condition, which says that, that these molecules are not allowed to overlap, there's an interaction. There's an additional interaction that is represented here by a red, a red wavy line, which favors alignment. This interaction is an attractive interaction that occurs whenever I have two dimers that are aligned and adjacent. They have to belong to the same row or the same column, and they have to be next to each other. This is what the model is. Now, in this model, it was introduced by Hyman and Lieb in 1979. They conjectured back then that it should have a liquid crystal phase, namely a phase with orientational order and positional disorder. They proved orientational order. We were left with proving uh, positional disorder. This result, by the way, is a joint work with, with Elliot Lieb. Uh, so again, what are the observables that we're looking at? This is very similar to what we had earlier, except it's slightly adapted to this case. I define here a measure with boundary conditions that favor vertical dimers. I chose vertical dimers. I could have chosen horizontal dimers. That doesn't matter. It's just to make the notation, notation clearer. So I set some boundary conditions that are going to favor vertical dimers in the bulk. Vertical. So these molecules there, they're either vertical, like this one, or horizontal. And I'm favoring the vertical ones. Uh, yes. Computer's over eager. This here is the sum over configurations. This here is going to be the set of dimer configurations. I put the hardcore condition in here, and I put the boundary condition in here. I have my observable. I have a, my activity to the power delta. This is the number of molecules. And here I have an interaction. It's a pair interaction. <coughs> it has a strength j. That's how strong, that's the, the contribution to the energy that you get whenever you have this event in which I have two uh, dimers that are adjacent and aligned. This notation here, this is a characteristic function of the fact that delta and delta prime are adjacent and aligned. This 1 half comes from the fact that I didn't symmetrize this product. And again, I take a limit as the size of the box is sent to the, to the entire lattice. And what is the result? I'm going to skip some of these. Uh, I'm going to skip all of this. OK, the result is that in this regime, this is a high fugacity regime. So I, I look at z large. That means that the, the activity is large. So I'm looking at high densities. For technical reasons, I also need to choose this interaction here to be larger than the activity. And what I prove is essentially here, I prove orientational order. This here is given a vertical edge E. Um, the probability of finding a dimer at this edge, of finding a molecule at this edge, is essentially 1 half plus corrections. This means that half of my edges are occupied. 1 half is the maximal density. I'm not going to be able to do much better than 1 half anyways. Now, the relevant part for this discussion here is the form of this error term here. This is not 1 over z. It's not a power of 1 over z. There's a square root in here. This is where the non-analyticity in 1 over z comes in. It's not analytic in 1 over z, but it is analytic in 1 over square root of z times the square root of e to the minus j. Okay. So you, have, you don't have analyticity in 1 over z, but you have analyticity in other variables that are small for high values of the activity and high values of the interaction in this case. And by expanding in these variables, we, we can compute the dominating terms and prove orientational order. So this, he, this here says that if I put vertical boundary conditions, I look at the probability of finding a vertical dimer, I'm close to 1 half. If I put vertical boundary conditions and look at the probability of finding a horizontal dimer, I find something that's very small. I have lack of, of positional order because if I look at truncated correlation functions, these are two vertical edges. If I look at the, the, the truncated correlation between finding a dimer here and finding a dimer there, I find exponential decay in the distance between the edges. So that's lack 
of positional order. OK, now I, I've reached the end of my time. So let me just quickly, to summarize what I said, um, I presented two results. The first was one in which uh, we found a criterion for, their, for the existence of a convergence of a convergent 1 over z expansion for these observables. But when this expansion fails to converge or fails to be well defined, there may be other expansions uh, that, that will still allow us to understand the high density phases of these, uh, of these models. All that, I'll thank you for your attention. Thank you.